Hey everybody, thanks for joining our Bible study. This is online Bible study for Red House Baptist Church. My name is Mark Smith. We are in the book of 2 Kings. So we've already run through 1 Kings and we are about halfway through 2 Kings at this point. And uh, we finished up in 2 Kings chapter seven last week and we're jumping all the way to chapter 12 this week. I encourage you if you've not done so to uh, go ahead and get started reading everything up to this point. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now that it is kind of tough reading because I was having to go back and I was having to check and see, now, wait a minute, was this king, king of Judah or king of Israel? And uh, it, it does get a little confusing, but it's well worth it to kind of set the background for today's lesson. So I do encourage you to go back and read that. That way you won't miss out on anything. So uh, having said that, let's just go ahead and open with a word of prayer and we'll jump right into it. Pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the grace that you show us, for the gifts that you've given us. Father, for the greatest gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you and, and we exalt you and we're just so thankful to you for loving us so much that, Father God, you offer to forgive us through your Son, Jesus. And we're just thankful to you. We love you. We pray, Father, that you would go with us as we study your word. We thank you for its truth. And we just pray, Lord, that you would write it on our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, as I said, we're in the book of 2 Kings. We're in 2 Kings 12, and it's verses 4 through 16. God honors people who demonstrates God's priorities. So, you know, guys, this is really, really a good lesson for, for me, and I hope it is for you as well when we talk about priorities. So, are there any repairs that need to be done around your home or maybe with your automobile? There are things that need to be taken care of. You know there are things that need to be taken care of. And I'm gonna guess all of us are probably gonna say yes. Uh, I spoke with my daughter this week and she told me that her car was making a noise and it was running fine, but it's rattling at certain times and then it would just go away. And I told her to get it looked at right away because while it's a little noise that's going away, now's the time to get it repaired before it gets too dangerous. And I told her that because I'm her wise father. The truth is, I've allowed the same things to happen, which is why I have wisdom in that. I have blown up a couple of motors through the years and, you know, for various reasons, not getting them serviced probably as, as often as I should. And uh, you just get busy and certainly, She's in that same boat, but yeah, repairs have to get done. And if you don't do them, they don't generally get better. They generally get worse. So why do we sometimes delay in making repairs that we know need to be made? And we all do it, you know we do it. And it could be that repairs could be very expensive. I know that in order to fix this soffit around my house or in order to repair the roof, talking about thousands and thousands of dollars, or if I need to repair a car, uh, nothing's cheap anymore, especially, you know, when you talk about ordering the parts and then the labor on top of that. And now, you know, those types of things are taxed. So things get very expensive. Uh, and it could be that it takes a lot of time and we just have very little of that. Uh, most everything takes time, doesn't it? I mean, and it's, you know, if you need your car, you depend on your car to get to work. You really can't just leave it someplace for days on end. Then you have to rent a car and that gets expensive. And, and sometimes we know things need to get done, but we prioritize it way down the list of things that need to be done. Because if we make a list, we know that that list gets pretty long. You know, I was talking to, to Pam not too long ago, and she was like, you know, I wish you'd just sit out here with me. And I told her, I said, when I sit out here, I look around and I say to myself, oh no, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. This needs to be done. And before long, man, it's not relaxing just to be outside. It's just a, a laundry list of things that need to be done. Uh, and do we ever regret not making some things a priority over others. You know, when we talk about prioritizing, and, and all of us do. And, and for me, I think about more than anything else, I think about relationships. Uh, guys, if the yard doesn't get mowed, if uh, 
You know, you, you don't get an extra coat of paint on the wall today. That's fine. Those things, those things can wait. And, you know, if we fail to make time for the necessary things, like in a relationship, they, just like repairs that need to be made, they get worse, okay? And we have to take time and we have to make the effort to work on relationships. But the very first relationship, the most important relationship that all the others hang on is our relationship with God. That's the one we've got to get right. When we get that one right, all the other ones have the, have the possibility of working out right. All right, so just a little background. I'm going to do this the best way that I can, but we covered a lot of material between chapter 7 and 12. So last week, we saw how God provided for his people, even as they were under siege by their neighbors, Aram. And, and that was probably under the reign of Jehoram, sometimes known as Joram of Israel, since it was Samaria, the capital of, of uh, the northern kingdom that was under siege. And people were dying. They were starving to death. And, and guys, like I said, this is a tough read to keep everything straight and clear from 2 Kings 7 uh, to, to 2 Kings 12. But I think it's important that we understand what's going on in each of these divided kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom with Samaria as the capital, the southern kingdom with Jerusalem as the capital. And God's people were ruled by kings, both northern and southern kingdom, who were unfaithful to God. And even as, as Jehu of, of Israel carried out God's commands to destroy the households of evil rulers in Israel and their families, uh, he did not faithfully serve God. So when it came to killing people, yeah, he served God faithfully. When it came to worshiping God and doing what God had required of him, he still didn't do that. He had Baal worship banished in the land. And you say, hey, where'd he go, Jehu, for doing that? But he continued to worship golden calves and other gods rather than just Yahweh God. But God also raised up a righteous king in Judah shortly thereafter. He was young, he was seven years old when he became king, and, and he was basically raised by the priest Jehoiada, um, and, and Joash tried to serve the Lord faithfully, but just like all of us, guys, he, he failed, but he was still, he's viewed in 2 Kings as a righteous man, a man who loved God and tried to follow God. So let's look at the first set of verses, and it's uh, 2 Kings 12, verses 4 through 8. There's a problem. So then Joash, and we don't know how old he was when he started this, but it says, Then Joash said to the priests, All the dedicated silver brought to the Lord's temple, census silver, silver from vows, and all silver voluntarily given for the Lord's temple. Each priest is to take it from his assessor and repair whatever damage is found in the temple. But by the 23rd year of the reign of King Joash, the priests had not repaired the damage to the temple. So King Joash called the priest Jehoiada and the other priests and asked, why haven't you repaired the temple's damage? Since you haven't, don't take any silver from your assessors. Instead, hand it over for the repair of the temple. So the priests agreed that they would receive no silver from the people and would not be the ones to repair the temple's damage. So there's a lot going on here, guys. So to whom did Joash originally assign the task of the temple's repairs? Who did he call together and say, guys, we got to repair the temple. It's in disrepair. Well, he called the temple priests, those who lived, uh, who, who spent all of their lives at the temple. He put them in charge of collecting funds. Those funds were in the nature of silver. Okay, so people would bring silver as part of a vow, like I'm going to, you know, if, if I'm blessed this year by God, I'm going to bring in more silver to the temple to repair the temple for that express purpose. And, and the temple was about 125 years old. And guys, you can imagine that after 125 years, things needed to be done, especially with the wars that Israel had been in, the times that it had been ransacked by Baal worshipers. It needed Things needed to get done. So how was the task to be funded? Well, it was to be funded by people bringing offerings in the form of silver, very specific offerings in the form of silver 
for repairs that needed to be made, as well as, like I just said, vows that people made to give. And again, done in the form of silver, not gold, not the melting down of temple treasures, anything like that. This was to be brought in by the people in order to glorify Yahweh God. All of it was to be used for these necessary repairs. This is uh, non-discretionary spending. This is set aside specifically for this task. So monies were brought in for that. Why was this task so important though for the young king? Yes, he didn't have to have a beautiful temple in order to rule as king. Didn't have to have a beautiful temple in order to serve God. Why was this so important for Joash? Because in his mind, this is God's house. And it's not just in his mind, this is truly God's house. It was the place where the people went to worship God and it deserved to be in good shape because it reflected their attitude towards Yahweh. Because if they take care of their homes, they take care of their fields, they take care of the streets, but they don't take care of God's house, the one and only God, they're not taking care of his house. That shows they don't really care. They would put that priority down on their lists, right? So again, we look at this after how many years had passed, how much time did Joash give them to make the necessary repairs? Guys, it says here that after, what was it, 23 years? The 23rd year of the reign of King Joash, they still hadn't done it, okay? They weren't doing anything. The priests had failed to use the collected money to make the repairs that had been ordered by the king. And I can imagine the frustration, not only of the king, but the people who had said, you know, we're dedicating this money so that repairs can be made for God, and we're trusting that the priests are going to do this. And they hadn't. Why had they defied their king? Why had they not made the necessary repairs? Man, it's easy, it's easy for me to sit here and say, man, you had a job to do and you didn't do it. But why do you fail to make the necessary changes that you need to make? Why do you fail to study the Bible every day? And, and I may have hit a nerve right there. You might say, you know what? I'm going to quit watching this guy. He, he's pointing his finger at me. Guys, it's not just you. It's me as well. Why do we fail to spend all day in prayer with God? And you say, well, hey, I'm busy. What do you mean spend all day in prayer with God? I can't do that. I have, I have other things to do. I have to work. I have to provide for my family. And that's 100% true. But guys, God should never be so far from your mind that you forget to spend time with him all throughout the day. How many times do you get in your car started up and say, God, thank you? Because I bet you're not thanking God when you get in there and try to start it up and it doesn't start. I bet you're not thanking him at that point, right? You're remembering God at that point, but you're not thanking him. You may say, well, we have other tasks, other priorities. Yes, we fail to properly prioritize when we don't put God number one. That's where he belongs. That's where he tells us he belongs. It's not my opinion. God tells us that. So what changes did Joash make in the repairing of the temple? He had to make a change. This wasn't working. It wasn't getting done. What he did was he removed the priest from the task. He said, you're not doing, I gave you the opportunity to do something to serve God. You didn't do it. So I'm taking that from you. Even the man who had helped raise him, he hid him from those who would have had him killed. Jehoiada had failed to honor the king and he failed to honor God. And I, I think about how difficult this must have been for Joash to go to him, a man he had to have respected and say, you failed. You didn't do the job. So what did they miss out on? They miss out on the blessing of serving God and doing something to honor him and, and, and restoring his house. And it made me think, do we ever miss opportunities to honor God? You know, we had a conversation with our daughter this evening, and, and she was so excited that I uh, had a great day at work, and she called us as she was leaving work, and we, we have been so hopeful that she would find a place to live close to work. Well, she just got transferred and she just had a new apartment. She's five minutes away. And, and 
we got done talking to her and she says, you know, we need to pray. And she's right. We can't miss the opportunities to honor God and to thank God. And I'm fortunate to have a wife who reminds me of that. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the next set of verses here. Let's look at verses 9 through 12. Then the priest Jehoiada took a chest, bored a hole in its lid, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one enters the Lord's temple. The priests who guarded the threshold put into the chest all the silver that was brought to the Lord's temple. Whenever they saw there was a large amount of silver in the chest, the king's secretary and high priest would go bag up and tally the silver found in the Lord's temple. Then they would give the weighed silver to those doing work, those who oversaw the Lord's temple. They in turn would pay it out to those working on the Lord's temple the carpenters, the builders, the masons, and the stone cutters, and would use it to buy timber and quarried stone to repair the damage to the Lord's temple for all the expenses for all the temple repairs. See, the chest of Joash was placed in the temple for what purpose? And it was placed there for the contributions that would be brought to the temple. And they're bypassing the priests now. That They're bypassing them and saying, you're no longer going to oversee this money that's brought in because you didn't do that in the first place. This is going to be in a very public place. It's as they entered the temple. No back room. It's going to be in a very public place beside the altar in, in the outer courtyard so that people could see the offerings that were being made. So what we're looking at, guys, is some accountability here. And, you know, as I look at that, I am so grateful for our church. One of the things that our church does, and I tried to, to copy and paste this, but this is from our, our website, and you can go online, and you can look at our weekly bulletin. And each week, we put in the bulletin our financial stewardship update. It's got our, our, um, our general fund. It's got our actual general fund budget. It's got the uh, weekly budget, what's required, what was given. Uh, it's got our building fund, and then at the very bottom, you see our family life center loan balance. So every week when we go, we're very upfront. There's accountability. This is what has been given. This is what we need, and we know what's going on. Guys, we learned from this, and we put into practice what God was trying to teach us through 2 Kings chapter 12. Who counted the money? Well, initially, it was going to be the priests, they were going to oversee that along with the repairs. Now, both the king's secretary and the high priest will work together to do that. Again, there's accountability and there's openness. The people would know that their gifts and offerings were being used to actually repair the temple. The money also went directly to those doing the work to make the repairs. I think that's awesome. All right. Again, what we're seeing is that, that God's people are paying the people who are making the repairs. And, and I, I was asking this, do we do a good job with accountability? And I, what I meant was, is that Red House? And guys, I, I really think we do. I think we do a very good job with that. At our, at our business meetings, we, uh, we have a financial report. We know where the money's going. We vote on where the money should go. Uh, everything is very upfront and open, nothing done under the table. And I'm so appreciative of that because what we see is that's what God desires from us is that, that we do that. And not just with money, guys, there needs to be accountability for all of us. All right. We need to have people who hold us accountable. And, and that's again, an example that we see there. So why would the people give so much money to this project because, man, the money must have been rolling in. The silver must have been rolling in. And why would they give so much? Because it pleased them to get to be a part of restoring God's temple. Guys, this wasn't taking the, the king's treasury and dumping it into the temple and him getting all of the glory for doing this. Guess they want to participate in this project. The people made this project a priority and they were faithful to make sure that it was done. And the king backed them in this. The king, the priests, and the people all shared in this together because when they share in it together, they get to celebrate together what they can do for God. They wanted to serve God. 
and how great it is, guys, when a church comes together, every one of us, and we serve one God. And that's so important that we do that because what we get there is shared blessings with it. We get to celebrate that together. And I just want to point out, guys, that number, $41,132.63, it wasn't too long ago. That was a quarter of a million dollars. Look where we are. I am so, so excited about where we can be uh, by the end of October, and I'm so looking forward to that. All right, so let's look at the last set of verses, and it's verses 13 through 16. However, no silver bowls, wick trimmers, sprinkling basins, trumpets, or any articles of gold or silver were made for the Lord's temple from the contributions brought to the Lord's temple. It's not what they were for. Instead, it was given to those doing the work, and they repaired the Lord's temple with it. No accounting was required from the men who received the silver to pay those doing the work, since they worked with integrity. The silver from the guilt offering and the sin offering were not brought to the Lord's temple, since it belonged to the priests. Why is it important that some of the gifts and offerings were used in very specific ways, in such specific ways, because that's what the people were told. They were told, if you will make the effort, if you will make the sacrifice to bring your silver for this specific purpose, we're going to let you sit. Guess they could sit and watch the stonemasons be paid with the silver that they brought. Uh, not too long ago, uh, the, the cathedral at Notre Dame uh, caught on fire. And it's being rebuilt, and you see some of the scaffolding that's going up there. Uh, uh, such an old structure it took forever to build, and I forget how long. I'm, I'm thinking like 300 years. It took forever to build that thing. But guess, transparency was so important because funds had been misappropriated by the priests. And what they needed to do was bring back some accountability and the trust. This time, they would know where the money went. They would see the money being paid out. But isn't it okay just to spend the money however they saw fit, that there was a need to, to build more uh, 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 bowls and, and some, some uh, uh, candle stands for, for God's temple? Couldn't they just use some of the excess for that? And the answer is no, not if the money was designated for a specific task. Yes, and I'm so pleased with how quickly, like I mentioned earlier, we are paying off at this Family Life Center debt. And some of you who've been with us for the last 18 years, you might say, quickly, it's been 18 years. Yeah, but this last effort, this last push, I cannot tell you how pleased I am and how thankful I am uh, that, that the whole church has embraced this. The stewardship team has done a wonderful job of sharing each week how the 1% more designated funds are being given. And we're told, hey, we took a check for the principal and this amount. Now we're down to this amount and it's saving us this much money. And when we say saving us this much money, it's saving God's church that much money. And what a blessing that we each get to play a part in that specific task, just like the people got to do when they gave to the chest of Joash. Money for utilities, insurance, salaries, and so forth, all of that's important. But getting to watch our principal disappear, th that's just such, such a great blessing. So is it even that important, though, to honor God with our finances? Yes, it is. We should honor God with all of our lives, including finances. And the church has the same obligation in honoring God. We need to keep up the things that need to be done around God's church, right? Because we honor God when we do that. I don't mean that we need, you know, to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars with pretty pictures and things of that nature, but we need to honor God by taking care of his church. Because remember, Christ is coming back for his church, and we need to, uh, uh, and, and that's us, that's the people, but still, we, we need we need to honor God, not just with our lives, not just with our thoughts and our prayers, but with our finances. I was telling a gentleman tonight that, you know, one of the toughest songs that we sing at church is I Surrender All. We sing it, and if we think about it as we do, that's a tough song to sing. 
because we're saying it to God and God knows what we've surrendered and what we haven't. And I would encourage you, just like with myself, that, that we are reflective in understanding what it is we surrender. God honors when we surrender all facets of our lives to him, including finances. All right, guys, thank you all for joining me. Come join us at Red House, 915 on Sunday mornings for Bible study. Love you guys. Hope to see you soon.